Some rivers are great, not only because they're vital arteries of communication for agriculture and the economy of a country or a region, but also because down through history, they've played a significant role in the development of ideas and civilizations. Mythic, sacred, like the Ganges, the Indus, and the Yangtze, the Mekong is one of the longest rivers of Asia. With its source high in the Himalayas, the Mekong flows several thousand kilometers across Central Asia before reaching Laos, where it has always played a central role in the country's history. Down through the ages, a number of different civilizations have succeeded one another on the shores of the Mekong. The very first was the so-called Standing Stone Civilization, a culture of great megaliths, which appeared downriver in the ancient times of the Neolithic Age. Much later, the Khmer Civilization, which was essentially Hindu, spread throughout the Mekong Valley, followed then by Buddhism, which took root in a permanent way, since it continues right down to the present day. The great stupa of Yenxian, the That Luang, is not only the symbol of the country's age-old link with Buddhism, but also the symbol of Laotian sovereignty. A sovereignty challenged for centuries by its Burmese and Siamese neighbors, and by colonial France, which established a protectorate over the country at the turn of the 20th century. Laos became independent in 1955, and was then swept up in the conflict of the Indochinese Peninsula. In 1975, the monarchy was abolished, and a People's Republic was proclaimed. Now, after many dormant years of isolation, the land of a million elephants, a name given by the first sovereign in the 13th century, has once again opened up to curious travelers. A peaceful country, bathed by the eternal Mekong as in ancient times. Uh, if you go back to the very beginning of Laotian history, the Mekong was seen first and foremost as a source of life. This is how the many different ethnic groups came from almost all parts of the country to live along the Mekong. All the Laotian populations, even those living on the other bank of the Mekong in Thailand, consider this river as an artery of their own body. The first stop on our expedition of discovery on the Mekong, southern Laos and Pakse, capital of Champasak province. Excepting the nearby Bolaven Plateau, famous for its coffee, the agricultural activity of the entire region surrounding Pakse is completely dependent on the Mekong. Here's the Pakse market, situated on the river's edge. It's the crossroads of the region. An unending ballet of farmers, fishermen, and sightseers of all sorts disembark from a fleet of small craft. The produce displayed on the market stands reflects the cottage industry aspect of the agricultural production, but the real surprise comes from the incredible variety of fish, a veritable treasure hauled up from the muddy waters of the Mekong.
karaoke and CDs of local music have started showing up in the market. Forerunners of a certain Asian modernism made in Thailand. In the center of the market, you'll find the little working class restaurants. They serve, among other dishes, pho, a Vietnamese soup of vegetables, chopped chicken, and rice noodles. It's true that a large proportion of the inhabitants of Pak Se, a city founded by the French in 1905, are of Chinese or Vietnamese origin. We're leaving Pak Se and heading south on board the Vat Pu, the only boat equipped with cabins. This former barge, which was used for shipping freight, has been very tastefully transformed into a luxurious and elegant floating observation deck. When I started navigating, I had a certain person with me, an old timer who knew the river and had a lot of experience. He's the one who taught me all the rudiments of navigation. He taught me all the techniques, how to navigate according to the direction and the speed of the current and the depth of the water. He's the one who taught me everything. And it's thanks to him that I was able to exercise this profession. The problem is when the current is very strong. Then there has to be two of us to make a decision, to decide the route to take to get through. We really have to be two. Unfortunately, Mr. Tudani's vision is bad, so we help each other out. I benefit from his experience and he takes advantage of my strength. We are headed for the region of Champasak, where we'll find one of the major archaeological sites of Laos, the Vat Pu, the mountain temple from which our boat gets its name. Between March and June, the beginning of the monsoons, the water level of the Mekong is at its lowest and navigation becomes very tricky. The boats have to weave along the river seeking out the channels between the sandbanks. The channel markers placed by the French are then a great help. The sacred aspect of the river is omnipresent, but on the Hindu Khmer site of Vat Pu, it takes on a special character. A spring at the foot of one of the cliffs had undoubtedly prompted the ancient kings of the region back in the 5th century BC to erect a sanctuary. A few centuries later, when Vat Pu had been assimilated into a vast Khmer territory, the site was linked to the famous temples of Angkor, a few hundred kilometers to the southwest. The religious complex visible today dates back to the 11th century. Two rectangular buildings with their intricately carved pediments face each other on a vast esplanade.
At the very end of the terrace, a once covered path leads to the first stairway. Where are we? Here we're coming into the second part of the Vat Pu temple of Champasak. Now we're going to climb the stairs. They were sculpted in two different types of stone, two types that we find in the construction of the temple. One of these types of stone was found in the Mekong, whereas the other comes from the quarries in the Champasek region. How long is this stairway? Around 10 meters. And where are we now? We're now in the second section. This second part of the Vat Pu temple of Champasak is protected by the guardian of the doorway. You can recognize him from his distinguishing features. First of all, a club, symbolizing force, then his left hand placed over his heart, a token of respect for all the pilgrims who come here. According to local lore, this statue is a representation of Kamata, the legendary king who is said to have built Vat Pu. It guards the second stairway, which leads up to the shrine and the sacred spring. The sacred water has its source at the summit. It then passes through the Lunga Parabata and flows down to the bottom. The spring has always been considered sacred. From the beginning of time right down to the present day, people have always been coming to the Vat Pu of Champasak. They take a few drops of this holy water in their hand and pour it on their head. With this act, they express the wish for a long and healthy life. This stream, which comes from the mountain, will flow into the Mekong, so the inhabitants of the region can receive all the blessings of the union of the holy spring of Vat Pu and the Mekong. The sacred spring used to flow from within the sandstone hypostyle chamber itself, easily accessible by its three doors. The sanctuary, which used to be dedicated to the Hindu Khmer deities, has since been transformed into a Buddhist temple. In the soft light of the setting sun, we get back underway on the Mekong. The water level of the Mekong is too low for the Vat Pu to go any further. So the next morning we continue our voyage toward Sipan Dun, the archipelago of 4,000 islands, in a smaller boat.
the river's channel markers stick up a bit further, and once the banks enriched with the silt deposited by the Mekong during the high water season dry out, they turn into miraculous vegetable gardens. water level is not only a godsend for the farmers, it's also good news for the herds of Zebus, which make themselves at home in the newly emerged mud banks. After Paxay, there are no more bridges over the Mekong, only a few unlikely craft ferry vehicles across, particularly the trucks coming from Vietnam. penetrating deeper into the Sipan Don Archipelago. Nearing the Cambodian border, 13 kilometers of rapids block the river, making it unnavigable. This is where the Mekong offers us one of the most beautiful panoramas of Laos, the Kong Pa Peng Falls. For centuries, the waterfalls of Kom Pa Peng, this supposedly impassable natural dam, has marked the end of the line for boats sailing both up and down the Mekong. Since this obstacle blocked freight transportation between Saigon in the south and Vientiane in the north, the French colonial powers undertook a project to get around it. In the little village of Ban Nakasong, we embark on a new motorized pirogue, even smaller than the one before. As we advance in the midst of a labyrinth of islands covered with lush vegetation, we approach the island of Don Con, where the French undertook their amazing project.
In order to bypass the falls, the French in 1920 constructed a 14-kilometer long railroad connecting the islands of Don Con and Dondet by this bridge. The boats coming up from the south, from Cambodia and Vietnam, would unload their freight at the southern tip of Don Con Island. It was then shipped by rail to the northern end of Don Det Island, where it was loaded back onto other boats headed up the Mekong to Vientiane. Almost nothing remains of that railroad, the only one in Laos, a few pieces of scrap metal and the memories of an old man who is the last living witness of that amazing undertaking. At the beginning, I came here to do laundry, the French people's laundry. I was earning 12 piastres a month. But when I realized that my salary wasn't enough to live on, I found work on a boat. I worked in the engine room, down in the hold. There I was making more than 15 piastres. I stayed on that boat for a long time, for more than 10 years. After those 10 years, they promoted me. I was in charge of engine maintenance. And one day, before the French left the country, I was transferred to the railroad. I worked there for a few years, the last four years that the railroad was in service. This locomotive, I don't really know where it comes from. Maybe from France, maybe from some other country, I have no idea. It came from Saigon. They shipped it up here from Saigon on a big boat. It took two or three nights for it to get here. Then they unloaded it at Bon Kong. It wasn't easy. It was heavy. We unloaded it from the boat. Oh yes, it was very heavy. The iron plates are thick. That's what the engine is like. It's all there. It's all metal. The French were really nasty. They would beat the coolies in this train. It really wasn't easy for the Laotians. They had never seen a train before. We brought it here piece by piece. We assembled it bolt by bolt. Just before the French left, before they gave the country back to the Laotians for them to run it themselves. They assembled all those who had worked for them according to their seniority. They lined us up. In this village there were only four or five of us. We were lined up and they stuck this on us. Then they took our picture. By rights we were entitled to a pension, but hell, I didn't get anything. All that effort and toll we put in, for that.
Up in the north of Laos, 800 kilometers from the Cambodian border, we discover another Mekong. Shrouded in the morning mist, the setting evokes the landscape of a Chinese engraving. The boats slide delicately along the surface of the water for fear of frightening their own reflections and the fisherman throwing his net attains the perfection of a gesture carried out since the dawn of time. We're on the Mekong, near Luang Prabang, the capital of ancient Laos. It's the moment when the monks leave their monastery to undertake their ritual quest through the streets of the town. There are no thanks to be expected from those begging for their food. Just the opposite. It's the believer who's grateful to the monk for accepting the alms, for he can thus accumulate merit that will ease his suffering and bring him a little closer to nirvana. Sometime before becoming an adult, every man leaves his family, shaves his head, dons the saffron robe, and, renouncing earthly goods, dedicates himself to the monastery for from three weeks to six months. Whereas the young monks go out begging, the elders receive the gift of their subsistence directly at the monastery. After 12 noon, the monks devote themselves entirely to meditation and prayer. In the afternoon, they take no solid foods. This explains why the morning meal, the only one of the day, is always so copious. Even though it lost its status as royal capital to Vientiane in 1540, Luang Prabang remains the cultural and religious heart of the country. Situated on a peninsula bordered by the Mekong and its tributary, the Nam Khan, Luang Prabang, as we see it here from Mount Pusi, is one of the most fascinating cities of Southeast Asia. In spite of its unimpressive size, Luang Prabang is home to more than 700 monuments, mostly of religious inspiration. Temples, pagodas, as well as a good number of monasteries. 
the most famous of which is no doubt the Vat Sing Tong. The Sim, the main building with its superposition of wooden roofs and its many changes of inclines, is symbolic of the harmony and elegance of the Laotian style. The building's rear facade is decorated with a remarkable mosaic composed of bits of colored glass representing a flamboyant tree of life, symbol of the founding of the town by two hermits. Among other buildings, the complex contains a chapel whose facade is decorated with scenes from the Ramayana. It contains a superb funeral chariot, 12 meters high. Sculpted in wood, covered in gold leaf, it has the shape of a seven-headed naga, the symbol of royal power. Over the past few years, tourism has begun to make its way to Luang Prabang. Souvenir shops have taken over old market stands, and the Hmong community has its own permanent market where they offer their traditional embroidery. In spite of this opening towards the outside world, Luang Prabang and the Mekong seem blessed with an eternal aura. In the gardens of this ancient royal lodge, where the perfection of the forms blends gently with the harmonious music, life seems untroubled and time at a standstill. of the setting sun, the inhabitants of Luang Prabang gather on the banks of the Mekong and the Nam Khan. These are moments that confirm their innate gift of enjoying life in the most simple way. The next morning we embark on a long riverboat, the Luang Se.
we leave Luang Prabang and continue our voyage on the Mekong towards the north. While we're making our way through the morning mist, 25 kilometers upriver in the village of Bampaku, there are women at the water's edge with some strange equipment. They tell the story that once a young woman was searching for her husband. As she came to the river, the Mekong, she met a man and a woman panning for gold. She went up to them and asked them to help her find her husband. Help me, I beg of you. I want to cross the river. He's gone back to his native village on the other side of the river. I want to find my husband, who's gone back to his native village. No, I won't help you. The woman snapped back. Thereupon, the young woman, faced with such wickedness, decided to put a curse on them. I condemn you to look for gold until the end of time. And, according to the legend, that is why even today, Laotian women continue to pan for gold in the Mekong. Panning for gold is a tradition that has been handed down to us by our ancestors. If we have some spare time after the day's work in the village, we come down to the river and pan for gold. It's a way of making a little money. Panning for gold, fishing, farming, it's as if nothing has changed in the customs and rhythms of the life of this village, which, like all Laotian villages, is organized around the Buddhist temple. They even continue to produce the Lao Lao, the traditional rice wine, in the old-fashioned way. Weaving and the sale of their crafts. These few clues point to the existence of a tourist industry that is budding in Bambaku, thanks to nearby Luang Prabang, and even more so, the famous grottos on the opposite shore of the Mekong. In the course of time, these grottos hollowed out of the cliff face have become holy sites 
in homage to King Sitatirat, who, according to legend, discovered them while out hunting. Over the centuries, the believers, as proof of their reverence, have filled the grottoes with an impressive number of statues representing Buddha. Even though the most ancient statues have been stolen by invaders or river pirates, there are still so many that you have to let your eyes get used to the dim light in order to be able to see them all. In recent years, the tranquility of the river has been shattered by the awful noise of speedboats making the run between Luang Prabang and the Thai border at more than 70 kilometers an hour. These craft tear through the landscape at such a speed that they maybe seem like mirages to the groups living on the banks of the Mekong for centuries with the same placid rhythm. For several years now, with the encouragement of the government, the Hmong community that traditionally lived in the highlands have been coming down to settle on the shores of the Mekong. Little by little, they've given up their traditional dwellings made of wood and cob for Laotian houses on stilts because of the flooding of the river. Aside from this practical adaptation, the Hmong have preserved their ancestral customs and beliefs. In our people, the Hmong, our ancestors taught us a very long time ago that we must be very careful about just how and where we build our houses. If you don't choose the plot of land well, you run the risk of being cursed. So you find a spot that suits you, you dig a hole in the middle of the plot, and you place a few grains of rice in the hole. If there are ten members of the family, you put in ten grains of rice, and then you cover the hole with a bowl. The next day, you uncover the hole, and if the rice is gone, that means it's not a good spot. At the beginning, according to the tradition that our parents and ancestors handed down to us, we lived in the mountains. But in the mountains, we were ignorant, and we didn't know how to read or write. We had no clinics or schools. We were a poor people. We came into the valley to live near the Mekong because here there are boats and cars. We can get around much more easily. We're not as isolated.
we spend the night in this traditional style lodge, recently built on a hillside overlooking the river. Early the next day, the Luang Se plunges into the morning mist to cover the last leg of our voyage. Whatever the weather, the captain has to stay alert. In addition to the natural obstacles, he has to avoid the speedboats running up and down the river and the pirogues crossing back and forth. The river is rather narrow in this region and there are many rapids. In the low water season, huge menacing boulders emerge from the water. This is when the navigation gets tricky and sometimes even dangerous. last port of call on our voyage, the village of Ban Kon Ton, populated by the Tai Lu tribe. The traditional occupations of the Tai Lu are weaving and farming. Their characteristic wooden houses, raised up on enormous stilts, differentiate the Tai Lu from the other tribes living along the Mekong. Like all the different ethnic groups living in Laos, the Tai Lu have adopted Buddhism. They do, however, continue to practice their animistic rites, spirit worship in particular, and the shaman holds the secrets which have been handed down from generation to generation. All my power comes from the book. This is the one that my grandfather and my father after him handed down to me. Everything I know, I learned from this book. It couldn't be anywhere else but here, in the house of my ancestors. A long time ago, when I was young, we didn't have any hospitals here. So I would take care of people, very simply, with the help of my books. As a result, everyone came to see me, and that's how they named me Shaman. If a sick person goes to the hospital and then afterwards sees that he hasn't gotten any better, he'll come to see me. I try to take care of him and even cure him. It's my duty. Even if I can't do anything for him, I carry out my duty as shaman. That's how it is. I chew some fruit, 
Mixed with holy water, I pronounce the magic words that I learned from my books, and I drive out the evil spirits by blowing on the sick person's body. Once the spirits have been driven out, I call back the souls of the sick person, and I bind them with a piece of cotton string tied around the wrist, the sick person's wrist, as we do in the traditional ceremony of the Basi. That way, the souls remain inside the person's body, and he gets better. That's all there is to it. It's very simple, natural. Hmm.